it's wonderful to uh, to welcome you all here and good afternoon my name is anna katrina de hemmer goodme and uh, it is my distinct pleasure to bid you all welcome to this lecture which is the fourth lecture in our lecture series on ancient attraction where we explore the dynamics of beauty power and sex appeal in the ancient world um, our lecture this afternoon is uh, presented by Dr. Mary Jane Kyler, and the title of Mary Jane's, uh, Mary Jane, sorry, Mary Jane's lecture this afternoon is "Guests, Gods, Heroes, and Hierarchs: The Fragrant Few of Mycenaean Pylos." Mary Jane's lecture will last for roughly thirty minutes, and then after the presentation, we have uh, ample time for questions and discussion. Mary Jane is assistant professor at the Norwegian School of Theology, and she is a research fellow working uh, for the ERC funded project, which is called Deconstructing Early Christian Meta Narratives. This project investigates full century Egyptian Christianity in light of material evidence. Mary Jane is trained as a Latinist and as an archaeologist, and she holds a PhD in classical archaeology from the University of Sydney from 2016. Mary Jane has been part of the team that excavates the synagogue at Ostia um, since 2006, and she's also been a field director with that excavation team uh, since 2011. When Mary Jane sometimes uh, has to summarize her own research, uh, she's, she does it in a very elegant way, I think. She says that she does archaeology of archaeology. Uh, and what she means by that is that she often works on artifacts and uh, material evidence that was excavated a long time ago. And then she has to go back, she has to re-examine the evidence and also re-examine the conclusions that were based on this evidence. So in a way, well, I find this fascinating because then it sort of makes Mary Jane even more of a detective than what archaeologists uh, usually are. The topic of Mary Jane's lecture today is in a way taking her back to one of her earliest loves uh, of her career, uh, namely the use and function of scented oils and perfumes in Mycenaean pilas. Uh, so we're dragging Mary Jane away from 4th century Christianity, all that modern stuff, and from the synagogue in Ostia, Roman imperial times, and uh, back into the, um, the time of the Bronze Age and uh, ancient Greece. So Mary Jane, thank you so much for rekindling your love affair with this topic for our mm -hmm. sake today. Um, thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna Katrina, and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful series. I have enjoyed every single lecture and am excited to share, again, really, re this rekindling of an old love, which is Mycenaean archaeology and Linear B. And I hope that during the question and answer session that I can su sufficiently answer the questions um, but perhaps we have some other experts in the audience as well. So let us begin with God's guests, God's heroes and hierarchs, the fragrant few of Mycenaean Pylos. Now let us begin with Mycenaean Greece. Let's place ourselves in time and space. The Mycenaeans are the name that we give to the people who inhabited Greece and a great deal of the Greek Aegean in between about 1400 and 1100 BC. They're known particularly for their monumental architecture, their pottery, and the tablets that they inscribed in order to keep records for the um, administration of their, <clears throat> what we call their palatial sites. And these tablets were written in a, uh, in a script that we call Linear B because a previous script, a different, similar, but previous script known as Linear A was employed by the Minoans. So just to make it clear, Linear B is not a language, but a script that wrote a very early form of ancient Greece, Greek. Now, 
here we are on Google Maps, and we're focusing in on the Palace of Nestor at Pylos. I'm actually going to go back to emphasize in this in this map, you're seeing some of the major what we call palatial sites, which are basically citadels of the Mycenaeans. And the one that we're focusing on today is Pylos in the southwestern Peloponnese. Now, here we are again in Pylos. Um, the modern day Pylos is down here. And the ancient Sandy Pylos in the Palace of Nestor is here on the top of Mount Englianos and some distance of about six kilometers from the sea. But it commands a view of all of the surrounding area as well as the sea itself. So the height of a defensive citadel. It's called the Palace of Nestor because of uh, basically classical archaeology's great love of naming different places after um, known, known peoples or mythological characters in the classical past. And so, for example, in Homer's Iliad, Nestor is the king of Pylos, who is one of the many kings who comes along to Troy to fight in the Trojan War to win back Helen. And so we see him described in the Iliad, who he, among them rose up Nestor, who was the king of Sandy Pylos. And then later in the Odyssey, um, when Telemachus comes to Pylos, he describes his visit there and going up to his lofty house. And of course, the palace of Nestor is in fact a lofty house. And so perhaps it's, it's very easy to place some ideas on the Homeric literature on some kind of knowledge of the Mycenaean past, but that is a topic for another day. Now, this is one of the few uh, beautiful attraction photos that you're going to see. I'm showing it to you <laughs> purely for that reason. Um, and also because this, this painting from 1820 shows a, a scene of Achilles uh, after the funeral games of Patroclus giving the prize for wisdom to none other than Nestor. So you can have a vision of this man as your king at, at Sandy Pylos. Now, I don't know how familiar the audience is with looking at plans, but I suppose that most people, if you've ever gone shopping for real estate or looked at plans of apartments, you might have somewhat of an understanding of these rooms. And I just wanna give you a basic idea of the layout. Now, the Palace of Nestor is one of the most, um, one of the best preserved uh, Mycenaean citadels in the Mycenaean world. And it's um, also highly characteristic of Mycenaean citadels. And one thing that you're always going to notice about these Mycenaean palaces is that there's a central, what we call a megaron or the throne room, which is dominated by a throne and also a central hearth. And you'll also notice if you ever took a, a Greek archeology span class, similarities between the, the setup of the megaron with this central room and then a porch and vestibule with the later archaic layouts of, of archaic Greek temples. Now, this is at the very center of this enormous complex, and this is just the ex excavated extent of this complex. There are numerous other buildings, outbuildings, and of course, tombs and burials in the area. Um, but one of the things that really dominates this complex are storerooms. So for example, between these rooms, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, there was something like 3,000 pieces of pottery stored in these rooms, most of them unpainted and almost all of them designed for banquets. So there's an enormous amount of storage and preparation going on, which I think many of us living in COVID times can understand quite well. This is an artistic rendering that of the Megaron. This would be the entrance, so down here, the entrance, there's actually three doors you'd have to get to to get to the central area. And you can also see the central hearth, which also has been painted here around the edge. And then paintings and motifs, some of which we know were there and some of which are imagined. 
And today you can still visit the palace of Nestor at Pylos. And these photos are from, um, from some time ago. In fact, I have not visited the palace since 2008. And it's now much more advanced for if you choose to go there, they now have um, like, they have ramps around so that you can walk over all the areas and look down upon everything. And I think it's much better for the archeology. span uh, But this is how I got to see it in the old days. And um, so here's an idea of some of the things that you'll get to see as you walk around. As you can see, now this was destroyed in about 1200 BC. So this is a very, very old building. This is an extraordinary level of preservation for something that has been, that was burnt to a crisp 2000 years ago. No, 3200 years ago. Where's my math? Um, so here's an overall view of the complex. Down here, you have, um, you have your uh, central hearth and you can still see the painting on it along, around the edge. There's also a beautiful little bathtub that's more about the size of what we would call a hip bath or something for a very small child. And then there are the remains of storerooms. Now, what I would like to talk about today, of course, are the storerooms um, associated with the treated or perfumed oil of this structure. And there are two types, or actually three types of evidence pointing to the types of oils that we have and where they were and, um, and the quantity and abundance of them. The main places where we know these oils were stored, were kept, are highlighted here in purple. And so I'm going to go through these places, these fine spots with you. Because as uh, in my training in archaeology, I'm obsessed with knowing where things come from, and so I like to take I like to take you through through these steps so that you have this sense of discovery in place. Now, one of the places is this room. These rooms 23 and 24. Now, these are right behind your megaron, and these are very, very obviously recognizable, or they were to the excavators in 1939. And the reason is, is that these storage containers were filled with oil, and oil is flammable. Now, as I mentioned before, this building was completely torched in 1200 BC. All the Mycenaean palaces that we know of were destroyed around this period, though not exactly on the same on the exact same timeline. And so what happens to oil when you put <laughs> flame to it, it explodes. And so there were, there was a huge amount of residue and black burnt up bits. So they discovered that in rooms 23 and 24. And what they also discovered in room 23 was an abundance of these linear B tablets, these little, these clay tablets. The interesting thing about linear B tablets is that they are temporary documents. They're little pieces of clay that are very soft or maybe dried to what we like call like a leather hardness. And the scribes were able to scratch in notes into them and then store them on the shelves. But when this building was burnt, when it went up in this massive conflagration, what happened is all of these temporary documents were fired and they were preserved up until this day. And this is the fate of all linear B documents that we have from any Mycenaean site is that they are temporary documents that we ended up having forever. So room 23 had a lot of these temporary documents. Here's a photo shortly after excavation showing the Megaron and then you're looking out toward the sea. 24 didn't have any of these documents, just some ceilings, but they had a lot of these um, uh, amphorae or Pithoi set into the walls. What else do we have? So we also have this area, this room 38. And room 38, an enormous number of a uh, great deal of, of pots were found, as well as a number of these linear B tablets. Now, room 38 
is not really a room. If you look at the plan, it's actually kind of part of it, like a pathway leading to this room with the bathtub, the bathtub that I showed you in the other slide. And so at first, one might wonder why on earth was a vast quantity of of olive oil, of perfumed oil found in this room. And why, uh, how, how did this happen? If it's a pathway, is it because it's next to the bath? The answer is actually that the whole building or most of the building was at least two stories. And so on the second story, there was a room filled with a vast quantity of oil. And when it burnt, it collapsed. And so when archeologists excavated this room in 1939 or so, they actually found on top of everything, the linear B tablets and the um, crushed pots with the oil, the burnt oil everywhere. And that explains that. And then also we have room 32, where all, and again, we had a great number of pots as well as some linear B tablets. Now, I just want to mention the pots again as a point of evidence. I do not have any photographs of the olive oil pots from Pilos. So I am substituting other ones that I think are very beautiful as representations. And so for example, what we have here is called a stirrup jar. And we call it a stirrup jar because its handle, I did not invent this name, but its handle sort of looks like a stirrup. And these are used by Mycenaeans and Minoans, they're a very ancient shape for the transport of various liquids such as wine and also olive oil. And to give you an idea of the variety of sizes, here you have a few little tiny jars for carrying different types of liquids. This is not a stirrup jar, but they, there are stirrup jars that are this large and even a little bit larger. And so next time you're in one of these museums and going through the boring section, you know, with uh, all of these muted toned pots, take a pause and have a look and see if you're looking actually at ancient Mycenaean oil and wine storage vessels. It's quite possible. Now, Linear B tablets were discovered in 1939 at Pilos, but Linear B was not formally it was not translated until 1952. They didn't realize for certain that it was representing Greek as a language. And this was a massive effort by a number of brilliant scholars. But by 1952, it was cracked and scholars worldwide got to work on interpreting the tablets from Pilos. Now, how do we identify a tablet as an oil tablet? The answer is here. And here, what you have is something that we call an ideogram, which is a symbol that shows you that stands in for an object. And this symbol stands in for oil. Before we turn back to the tablets, I just want to address one thing, which is that we have all these fine spots, but there were also other tablets found throughout the palace with this symbol on them. But of course, because people were going about their daily life and different tablets were being moved to different places, but these are the main places. And I also wanted just to discuss very briefly the location of, these, um, of the oil in an upstairs room. Why store it in the upstairs? Well, Theophrastus, uh, admittedly, he's a fourth century BC writer, and so we're like looking at a thousand years later, but we, we use what we can <laughs> in archaeology and in reconstructing these things. He says that perfumes are ruined by a hot season or place or by, put, be, by being put in the sun. This is why perfumers seek upper rooms which do not face the sun, but are shaded as much as possible, for the sun or a hot place deprives the perfumes of their odor. So next we're going to start looking at the sorts of scents and materials that we have in the Linear B tablets. And here I have given you the transcriptions 
maybe you can just enjoy looking at them or maybe you're a linear B expert and have a correction to make, but just to give some, some sense of the process here. So in this top one from room 23, that's a room behind the Megaron, we have one to Tinas, sage infused oil for anointing, 19.2 uh, liters. And we have rose infused oil for anointing and 19.2 liters. So this is on the same, the same thing, these two different entries. In both cases, we have our familiar oil ideogram. And then down below, we have another one that just says cuparis infused, which is kind of like a sedge grass, sedge, rose infused oil, 40 liters. And so this one we would just call like a totaling tablet, or it's just giving, uh, it's a record of how much they have maybe in that room or in, in a given jar. This is from room 38, which is um, <clears throat> down uh, the upstairs room. But before we continue to talk about perfume, we need to problematize a little bit the word perfume. And that is, it's very much a, a modern conception. When we think of perfume, I think of Chanel number no. five and you know Marilyn Monroe putting on, <laughs> this is in fact a bottle of Chanel number no. five. I believe it was part of an ad campaign, I'm not sure. Um, and, but we think of perfume as something that's primarily used for scent. Yet ancient people did not in fact think of perfume as just for scent. They thought of it in a number of ways. They, when they discuss the aromatics infused in an oil, scent is one property of the infusion. So perfumes can also heal, they can soothe, they can taste good, they can be bitter, they can cause hallucinations, they can act in, as an aphrodisiac, they can dye skin or hair or wool, they can kill, and the list goes on and on. If you want to read more about all the things that different herbs and perfumes can do, I highly recommend you read the Ephrastus Deodoribus, for example, concerning smells. Um, and then Dioscorides writes a lot about perfumes and even gives recipes as well. So when we say perfume, we have to always think, what are some of the other things going on besides just how it smells? So let's then look at the properties of the oils that we have and what they're infused with, considering beyond just the scent. Now, when I started looking into this uh, many years ago, I was mostly struck by the fact that sage didn't seem like a very sexy smell for a, for a perfume. And I think that's why I started even thinking about these infused oils as something other than just for their smell. But what I didn't really think about as much at the time is the fact that, of course, everything is going to be so very seasonal. Oil, olive oil is only at its peak in the first year. Any perfume that goes into olive oil, any, any um, scent is only going to be good for about, again, about a year, and it's going to start to lose its scent. Um, and if people are using things rapidly enough, they're going to be moving through it quite, quite quickly. And if we consider that this, the, temp, the, the um, palace at Nestor was destroyed in this massive conflagration, presumably by enemies, what we're seeing is just a moment in time. We just, the palace happened to be burnt down when they were making the sage perfume and, or the sage infused oil and the rose infused oil. It was that time of year when they still had it, at least. I guess not when they were making it, but when it was stored. Um, but nevertheless, what else can we say about sage? There are basically four main types of sage that can be found in Southern Greece. Uh, there are numerous articles on, on the history of botany and trying to trace back uh, different, different botanical materials and different plants and understanding what we had in antiquity, what was the ancestor of which. And something like this is, is highly reliant upon different archeological investigations, um, people who basically can do archeobotanical analysis of finds. And this is just a very, very kind of up and coming um, 
area of research. It's something that we've had the ability to do for a while, but we have to get all the teams and the archaeologists on board. And so in the coming years, we may have a lot more information about perhaps the type of sage that was available or being used in, um, in Mycenaean Pelos. But for now, we can say that we have these basic sages that are there now, and they all share the same basic properties. They all, and these are studies that appear in modern journals, even up until a couple of years ago. They have uh, main components that are, for example, antiviral, antimicrobial, antifungal, um, when smelled or ingested, can, be, can serve as a memory enhancer. They're working on it with Alzheimer's, for example, but also can have major psychoactive properties. One chemical that all of these forms of salvia have in common is called fusione, which is also the psychoactive element in wormwood, which is what makes absinthe absinthe. Now, of course, we can't say for certain what the degree of potency was and how well that they were with, they were drawing out all of these different constituents into the oil, but all of these are possibilities. So if we think of the smell of sage, we can also think of how it might have been healing. Another important thing to keep in mind is that olive oil is quite healing and good for the skin. Dioscorides, who was writing in the first century CE, so we're getting further and further away from the Mycenaeans, um, writes that it heals stingray wounds, it restricts bleeding, and heals ulcers and sores. And I was also able to come across um, an example in Jamaica where they use sage mixed with coconut oil for scorpion bites. And so it's still, it's, it's something that if you're in a pinch, I would re recommend getting some sage and rubbing it with some oil and rubbing it on your skin and see what happens. Oh, and Pliny the Elder, Here's, heals ear sores, cleanses snake bites, and alleviates dysentery. Self-experimentation is entirely um, caveat emptor. So then we, we move on to rose containing oil, which is in a large number of tablets as well. And again, we have the same issue of not knowing precisely at all what our main rose source was. But these are the main sources that we have now in the Peloponnese in Greece. The one that we wonder about the most is a rose that comes, that kind of appears in literature in the late medieval, early uh, Renaissance period, and the Damascus rose that was used predominantly for perfume. And there are a lot of botanists who spend time wondering about the origin of the Damascus rose which would have been extraordinarily fragrant um, and was used to make the finest of perfumes. So perhaps they had something like this available to them. But rose again has a number of healing properties. It's used for headaches and earaches and sore gums apparently. And also of course is an aphrodisiac. It's also used, it appears specific, um, specifically in the Iliad. Um, the, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Homer's Iliad, but there's a lot of violence and very terrible things in it. And um, one of the things that happens is that Achilles, after he defeats his enemy, Hector, keeps the body, does not return the body to, uh, to Priam, but instead decides to tie the body to the back of his wagon and just like, go around the city of Troy every night. But Aphrodite, the daughter of Zeus, um, wards off this, this, uh, the decay by anointing the body of Hector with the rose oil so that when Achilles is carrying out his completely bizarre and awful rage, um, he's not tearing the skin of the body and ultimately it's returned to, to the fam, the body is returned to the family. So we can also see here that rose oil would also be not just great for the skin and to keep the skin from tearing, but also probably um, just is good for funeral ritual. Now let's turn to this cuperus, this sedge. Uh, now precisely which one this is, it's hard to say. It could be one of either. Um, Theophrastus writes of cuperon as a fragrant ingredient. Um, and this is identified as cuperus rotundus. It is, the roots of this are ground up and used in modern perfumery in India. And Theophrastus states that cu cuperon comes from 
Asia. Um, the essential oil combats different types of staph, which is a type of infection that you can get on your skin. So another option is that cuparis refers to <clears throat> um, cuparis longus, which Dioscorides describes as a thickening agent, something called a stima for making perfume, for making these, these perfumes. It's native, also this one is more likely because it's native to Southern Europe. However, when I was actually just researching this one again, because I just, I don't like the idea of something just being in there as a thickening agent. I was reading descriptions of its scent. I have never smelled this. And I really need to, I need to go back to Greece and go dig up some plants because this is supposed to have an un, unpure violet scent. And I wonder how this would smell. This, the cuparis is, when it does appear, it appears along with rose. And so it could have added maybe a violet and rose scent mixed together. It does not appear with sage, for example. So that mixture doesn't happen. And then finally, we have eti. So we have something etiwe, eti infused for Poseidon, for the spreading of the couches. For years, it was thought that eti was henna and that the leaves of henna imported from Egypt would have been infused into the oil in order to dye it. Um, and there's no point in explaining. It's a very, very roundabout way that they got to this um, conclusion. But when I started really looking into that, I began to wonder, because when you look up the active ingredient in henna, and I don't know if you guys have ever dyed your hair, or your skin, um, henna only, it's water soluble, it only reacts with proteins. And and oil is not a protein. So I did do a person, I did, I carried out an experiment um, that I published in, in an article a long time ago in which I tried to dye oil with henna and I found that it is impossible. So it, you cannot dye oil with henna. And also if you put henna in oil and try to dye something with that, it does not work. And so it also doesn't preserve it. The option that they could have been using the flowers um, to scent the oil is not really a possibility because the flowers wilt very quickly. And so whatever Ertis is, is, it remains an open question. And so I allow you to discover it for me. That would be wonderful. The missing ingredients. However, we did almost certainly have dyed oil. I'm sure that you all may have noticed. <laughs> that sometimes there are words after this ideogram ole or syllables. Here we have po, which is probably an acrophonic abbreviation for ponikio, dyed red. Ponikio is also an ingredient that appears on tablets from Knossos. And in fact, Dioscorides tells us that the final step in the production of rose oil is to infuse it with alkanet. And alkanet is abundant in the Mediterranean. I personally have purchased alkanet and I have dyed olive oil with it. And I can tell you that it turns it the most brilliant shade of crimson. I highly recommend alkanet for all of your dyeing, all of your um, uh, non-protein dyeing purposes. Now to conclude, I gave it all away in the title of the talk. Who is receiving this oil? First, there are many, many different recipients of this oil but they're largely not the common people. So first we have an example, we have guests. Here in this tablet uh, from room 23, we have two potnia for the dipsioi, for the guests, for guest quality, 9.6 liters of oil. Potnia, you may rec recognize, um, she appears in Homer and in, in later sources, as a, a like a proto uh, um, Diana or um, the goddess of the hunt, and so perhaps this is this is who she is, a uh, proto Artemis, and the dipsioi. It's hard to say. Some people interpret that as the thirsty ones, i.e., maybe the dead people, but we don't really know. But certainly, we've set aside guest or guest quality oil to the tune of nine point six liters. That's our only tablet with guests. Now gods, uh, obviously there are very many gods who receive oil. For example, we have oil for Hupoyopatnia, so Patnia again. 
And in this case, it's an unguent for clothing. This is also something that appears in Homer and something that uh, the scholar Cynthia Shelmerdine has worked on somewhat extensively on the use of oil to make garments supple and of course, to make them uh, more waterproof and smell good. Heroes, here we have from room 38, for the thrice hero, we have rose infused oil for 0.4 liters. So this is a teeny tiny amount of oil compared to some of the larger amounts that we've seen. And um, one possibility is that when we have small amounts of oil, is that this is oil that's designed for uh, libations. And here we have our hierarchs and uh, the hierarch of the um, of any Mycenaean palace is the so-called Wanox or like the the warrior king. I'm not really sure how they're how they're translating it these days, but he's the <clears throat> the big guy on campus at uh, at Pilos, and he also receives quantities of oil. So we have oil to the Lusian fields, which is sage containing at 6.4 liters. And then to the dipsioi, again, the dipsioi and the wanox to the wanox sage infused oil, 9.6 liters. And I've also included here just another example of the sorts of things that you can get. So we have here um, these, we have festivals and we have months. So for example, we have for Poseidon, Poseidone, and then for the spreading of the couches, which is probably some kind of festival. And I love the name of it. I kind of imagine maybe dragging all the cushions outside and having an outside party, which is probably not at all what's going on, but who knows. And for the, for the purpose of just make, keeping things from not going over too much, I just made a, a list of some of the other recipients that you see just in the olive, on the, um, olive oil tablets. So you have the Pakianians, whoever they are, um, the Wanasoi for the festival of the dragging of the thrones, um, also Wanasoi for Air, possibly Ares. So we have starting to see some familiar gods in here. We have to the attendants for anointing, also for anointing in the month of navigation. So that's one of the months that comes up. So this is probably the month in which, or the month immediately prior or following the destruction of the palace. We also have to the sanctuary of Zeus, to the Megastos, and then simply to the gods and a number of other examples. But what I can say is that I've never been able, and I don't believe anyone else has been able to detect uh, when we talk about ancient attraction, any sort of association between the perceived gender of an individual or a god and the scent associated with the given oil. And so that's something that I was not ever able to, to unpack. Although I did come across an interesting comment in Theophrastus the other day when I was preparing and reviewing this material to, to talk to you about. And that's that Theophrastus recommends rose oil for men because women need a stronger scent, something that really lasts. Of course, this is much, much later than this period. And with that, I would love to hear your questions and comments and I will end the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Jane. That was wonderful. I'll just uh, see if I can give you a Zoom applause here. Thank you so much. Um, really, really so intriguing material you had there. Um, so we now have um, plenty of time for questions and discussion. So please, if you would like to um, make a comment or ask a question for Mary Jane, um, go ahead. You can either I can see quite a few of you have not turned on your cameras um, and perhaps for the discussion, I would like to invite you to do that. It, it just makes it a little bit more fun also for Mary Jane to be able to see you while you ask a question. Thank you. Uh, so please, if you have a question or a comment, 
uh, you can either write to me in the chat or uh, just raise your hand on the screen like this and I'll try to uh, to keep track of a, of a speaker's list. And we have a comment from Robert. Uh, please yeah. go ahead, Robert. Hi, that was great. I mean, I learned a lot, but I want to ask you about anointing because it seems in Aegean Bronze Age archaeology, people are always talking about libations, but one rarely hears about anointing and there's never been any equipment that's necessarily been associated with anointing. Um, I've tried, I've thought about it with Raita, and I think that it's, you know, really important part of the culture. So I was really happy to hear that there were a couple of tablets that mentioned anointing specifically. I was wondering if you had any thoughts further about it. What was anointed and what equipment might have been used for anointing, if there was anything found in the rooms with the tablets that mention anointing specifically. I think it was tablet uh, 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 one, uh, 1223 uh, specifically that, that talked about anointing in room 23. So thanks again. Um, with anointing, um, I think that we're dealing specifically with, with, when I think of anointing anyway, it's, it's rubbing oil onto somebody or something. So for example, a statue or a person, and I don't know if you would actually need very much equipment for that, except for a stirrup jar, probably a small one, because you'd be able to pour out small amounts and you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have the danger of pouring out too much. And so in that sense, uh, <laughs> there's background noise. I hope you guys don't hear it. In that sense, um, the syrup jars would be the equipment. As far as the libations go, I, I have only read a little bit about the evidence for libations in linear B. And I think that there's th the obvious evidence for libation is in the throne room at Pelos, uh, that central room with the hearth. There is a uh, actual trough with a little pool at the end of it that's directly next to where the throne would have sat, that the only explanation for it is that it was for pouring libations onto the floor, but not having it go everywhere. Yeah, I, I don't doubt the libations, but oh, it, okay. it's the question of anointment that I was wondering about because I mean, we, we're all pretty much familiar with libations and talk about libations and especially that channel is the great evidence for it. But it was more uh, about anointments, which seems to be something that's rarely discussed in Aegean archaeology. You know, it, it seems to be, it's all focused on libations. And I've wondered, that's okay. what I said, I, I've thought about Raita, some types of Raitas being used for anointments. And a stirrup jar to me is a transport object. I mean, to me, a libe an anointment is, is really something kind of ceremonial. And so to use something as mundane as a, as, a, as a stirrup jar, which, you know, they can be lovely and all that, it's, it's fine. But I mean, it's possible what you're saying. And I think that's actually an interesting uh, observation because you can control the flow of liquid out of a stirrup jar really easily. And I think that's certainly important in an anointment ceremony. But I'm mean, thinking, for example, of in the Old Testament, I mean, you know, Saul is anointed as to become the first king. And, and so I've always thought of it, especially, you know, the tablets do seem to talk about it in terms of, um, you know, important people being anointed. But I've also thought about Bytels, for example, for which there's not that much evidence, but which we have in, in like the gold rings as being something that may well have been anointed uh, because, you know, then it's kind of sparkles and, and, and uh, reflects. Anyway, thanks so much for your, uh, your comments and your work. Thank you both. I, I'm using my privilege and chair and I'm jumping in with a follow-up question here because I was just wondering about exactly the wording in, in the tablet that, uh, that Robert mentions, 1223. Is there any possibility of translating that word for anointing in a in a slightly less ceremonial way? Could it also just be sort of applying oil to your skin for I don't know uh, purposes of hygiene, cosmetics, health treatment? Um, is um, or is it sort of anointing as a as has, does it ha does it carry a particular ceremonial connotation? No, there has, it has no ceremonial connotation whatsoever. Um, Wei Arepe just is a, it's, it's um, Wei it indicates a purpose and then Arepe is um, the application of oil. So the, when we say anointing, 
I think that the tendency is to think that we're dealing with a, um, I was just looking at the, that we're always dealing with these highly ceremonial contexts simply because the people and the, the, the recipients of the oil are ceremonial, but whether or not it was always involved in ceremony, um, it's hard to say. The thing is, is that there is so much oil. I don't have the numbers I had in front of me, but many a person has, has added up the amount of oil in the tablets, the amount of oil that's represented by the, the volume of containers. Of course, we can't know that all the containers were full so that there's always a guess, but we're looking at many, many hundreds of liters of oil. And so it can't all have been used in tiny quantities for very like careful application. Um, one, thing, one thing to consider also is that perhaps they were, they were using it um, to anoint guests who were coming in for the feasts because I mentioned that there were something like 3,000 pieces of ceramics that were discovered um, around, or maybe 6,000, no, 3,000, discovered at the site. And so that's a huge number of dishes. These are all dishes for like drinking and eating. So if you're having 3,000 people over, do you have everybody kind of anoint each other, anoint themselves to smell better? Cooking oil. I'm sure that huge amounts were used for cooking. I mean, because we also have um, the quantities mm -hmm. of bulls that were being sacrificed for these banquets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they may have been boiling it in water, but I'm certain, but, you know, oil was certainly, especially sage infused oil must have been quite mm -hmm. wonderful. People seek mm -hmm. it out today. There's, an, there's one of the sage infused oils, uh, Robert, that's possibly could be interpreted as unfiltered, which also makes me think of something that you might like want to add on to rather than cook with even. Um, but I, ab I, yeah, I, I absolutely think that there's a, a dining, a dining element. Though we specifically have sage um, oil going for anointing, right? So it's not, it's not just cooking or just anointing or just libation, but a lot of things. Yeah. yeah, well, that's you know the yes. Bronze Age. Everything is multivalent. You yeah. know, so many things have depends on the context. I mean, even uh, with Raita, you know, they could be ritual, they could be totally mundane and, and practical. So, yeah. I would love sure. to know a practical, I guess, a practical use of a Raitan would be to just sift something from one, this vessel into another. Yeah. 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 Maybe not mm -hmm. a highly decorate, decorated one, but a- Well, I mean, the, it one. depends on the type of Raitan, you know, the narrow neck ones. I've talked about, they yeah. work like, uh, uh, you know, like a, a straw in a Coke bottle. You dip it into a liquid, it fills up from the bottom, you, you know, you cap the top of it and you transfer it to uh, something else. Yeah. Well, More I popular would also, in the Minoan world. I would also actually say that when you were describing stirrup jars as transport vessels, like it really depends on the stirrup jar because sure. obviously we have these massive stirrup jars that could hold like 60 liters or something like that. But we also have these really, really tiny ones that are, you know, beautifully decorated. And those are certainly not for, maybe for personal transport, but I think they're, they're for just keeping- Oh, they're like you know, little your... perfume bottles. Exactly. Yeah. I yeah. mean, those are the ones that we find in the Near East, you know, exported by the hundreds. That's Beautiful so... little decorated ones. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, we have a comment or a, a question rather from Bruno Genito. Bruno, would you like to ask the question yourself? Go ahead. Um, oh. Okay. Well, it's. I'm afraid that I can't hear Bruno right now. I can see he unmuted himself, but the sound is not coming through. Yeah, you can hear me now? Yes, yes brilliant. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I had a problem with microphone. No well, worries. First of all, thank you very much to the speaker because it was very interesting. The question is... Uh, uh, there is any concrete archaeological evidence apart of the epigraphic testimonies, because the the speaker was talking about the tablets from Pilos, okay, but there is any bioarchaeological or botanic geobotanic remains which can support the hypothesis of reconstruction of the identification of those plants and perfumes, or is only on the basis of the epigraphic evidence, which is very important. Of course, but sometimes it's not enough to to formulate any 
historical hypothesis? This is my question. Thank you. That's an excellent question. And so the answer is that at Pilos, there is no archaeobotanical evidence because of when it was excavated mainly, which was in the late 1930s. And um, it, there remains no evidence to this day, as far as I know. At other Minoan, especially Minoan sites, um, uh, we have evidence from Crete and Cyprus, I believe as well, of archaeobotanical evidence for types of perfumes and ingredients. And interestingly, something that comes up there is the predominance of the use of iris root. Um, and that appears, I, rose appears in um, ancient perfumery from the Minoan period and elsewhere in the My Mycenaean world when we have archaeobotanical evidence, but also iris root is a main ingredient. And so interestingly, we don't have any evidence of that at Pelos. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. It, it's a pity because I know. Uh, sometimes the, the bioarchaeological remains can give more support. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank Absolutely, you. we need it. And um, I, though I have to say that in most um, most prehistoric Bronze Age excavations I know going on in in Greece, people are working very hard at at yeah, doing yeah. this work now. Um, and, in, and, in, yeah. the, in the same times, if if you have sometimes botanical remains, you don't have you don't have epigraphic testimonies. So mm -hmm. it's a big contradiction. Yeah. The, Okay, okay, thanks. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Bruno. Um, is, there, is there any chance that the mysterious Etsy could be the iris root? Is that something you've considered? Um, I have, and I can't remember why I don't think that's what it is. It might be because it appears as a word elsewhere somewhere, but you know what, maybe. Right. Well, if you don't think so, you're probably right would have to complement sage because it appears on its own and with sage mixed together. That I will say, that's right. all. Yeah. Thank you. So any other questions or comments? I'm just going to look at my gallery view again so I can see hands going up. Laura, please go ahead. Um, hi, thank you so much for your paper. Can you hear me okay? I have headphones. Yeah, yeah. very good. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. I learned so much um, from the, the talk and also the discussion, and it's sort of making me rethink um, some other texts that I've been looking at. So I'm a biblical scholar, and um, I've been thinking about Aaron, who is anointed, his clothing is anointed with various sweet-smelling oils, and I think we tend to interpret that ritually um, because of the use of oil in consecrating priests. But on the other hand, the clothing is explicitly said to be made for the purposes of being beautiful. Um, and so I'm sort of rethinking um, distinctions between ritual anointing and, and, and um, use of oil in the purposes of beautification. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd wondered if it is possible to distinguish between those different functions or if it's always a bit blurred. I don't know. I. I my answer would be as good as yours, I think, or in, as, as, as our collective idea, but I think it is blurred. What do you think? <laughs> as I said, I'm rethinking. I, I guess I tend to also go on context and then you know, it's, it's a priest, um, it must be ritual, but then on the other hand, maybe we can, um, yeah, like rethink it in light, in light of, other potentials and given that his clothing is supposed to be so beautiful maybe this is you know a, a, there's a different function to his application of oil so thank you thank you that's an interesting idea i i can't i can't resist the temptation to jump in because i've just yes. been working on some of those Please. texts as well uh, about aaron uh, the high priestess vestments and that's in the book of exodus chapter 28 and also some of the other trappings for the for the sanctuary in the Hebrew Bible. And, and I, I think it is a, a blurred function in a way that, that part of his, in a way, part of his ritual function is to look beautiful, smell luxurious and powerful and majestic. And, and uh, also the oil could be, you know, make your hair look good as well. 
possibly your clothes. I mean, so I, I think it is sort of a, of a of a complete image almost of 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 the being beautiful, being posh, and and sort of luxurious looking is almost part of the ritual role that he has to um, that he has to perform in this context in a sanctuary in a sanctuary setting that is also beautiful and vivid with colors and gold and gemstones and incense and scents and so i think it's sort of to almost like a and almost thought as a total theater experience in a way i don't know what you think about that laura um, I love the way you describe it. It's so multi-sensory, the smells, the sights, as clothing has bells on, the sounds. Um, and also I was thinking as you were speaking about the, the hair being anointed with oil, of course, priests are not allowed to dishevel their hair in mourning. So maybe the priest was a big hunk. <laughs> That's all we need to reconsider. Thank you. Thanks. I don't mean to make this about the Hebrew Bible at all, sort of I don't want to draw us away from Mycenae, but uh, but just to say that I think this is probably part of, of a lot of ancient cults to to create this lushness in a way of of a multi sensory sensorial experience in a way. So I'm just going back to my gallery view here in, in case anyone would like. Uh, Robert, oh, yeah, Rackland. Robert, please go ahead. Racklin, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, Dr. Carla, thank you very much for your talk. It's an area which I have with which I have very little familiarity. Also, I enjoyed your the article in Igayum, which was the representation or the reprint of the speech you gave in Copenhagen some years ago, which was good a good preparation for your talk. My question is a rather simple one. Uh, we know that the uh, tablets uh, accounting for the uh, oils were stored in Nestor's palace. Do we know anything about the storage locus of the oils themselves? Yes, the oils were stored mainly with the tablets. So, or the, I should actually say the tablets are mostly stored with the oils. Um, they were stored in the magazines behind the, um, the, the Megaron with the, with the central fireplace. And then they were stored sort of in the area above the bathtub and back in room 32. So there must have been other storage areas for all of, for the oil because there, there seems to be more oil being recorded than there is room for it in these little spaces. But they haven't excavated everything yet. Well, what's the archeological evidence for, this, for, the, for the fact that the oils were stored in the palace? Because of the conflagration of the palace, they uh, the, the fire burnt the oil at such a high temperature that there was like a greasy film on top of everything and inside of some of uh, the pots. And so that was the evidence that they were able to see. It must have been really, really hot. That does answer it. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> a long time ago, 3,000 years ago. Yeah. Thank you. So, we, anyone else would like to make a comment or ask a question? Otherwise, I'd like to jump in again, again, um, because I was actually thinking of something along the same lines of these like huge quantities that we've talked about um, earlier as well. I mean, I think one of the um, tablets mentioned 19 and a half liters and and that was, I mean, so it, it's really, so I was just wondering, what is your feeling about this oil? Is it something that sort of goes into the palace, probably is produced in the palace, and then is all consumed in one way or the other inside the palace, either for um, hosting greasy parties, that you, as you suggested before, or, uh, or, or is it more of an economy in a way that it's being sold out of the palace as well. What what are your thoughts on this? Because it, I'm just thinking that the quantities are so massive that it almost reminds you of, of, of sort of storage for sale rather than storage for consumption. Well, there's a couple of things about that. One is that I'm not up to the latest, whatever Dimitri Nikasas is saying about the Mycenaean economy, 
Um, but you know what you learn in linear B Mycenaean class 101 is that the Mycenaeans have a redistributive economy where the um, where people are giving or producing things and giving it to the palace and then the palace then redistributes it. I don't think that's entirely the model that's being believed now, but I'm not up on that. What's interesting in the case of the olive oil uh, production and the, the infusing of the olive oil, the making of perfume, is it seems to be, at least in the case of Pilos, and I think also at Knossos and elsewhere, directly under the purvey of the palace. This is not something, it appears not to be something that is farmed out, or at the very least that the palace itself has direct control over. And we know this because there are a series of other tablets dealing with the disbursement of um, pots specifically for storing oil um, and for the, the actual ingredient lists are being written up and saying so much coriander is going to so-and-so the unguent boiler, for example. So we know that this is actually happening within the palace. As far as is it being sold, given the, given the fact that you, we find Mycenaean um, and we know for a fact when, when we can study the, the actual, like the construction of the pots, we have Mycenaean perfume or, and wine, basically these, these liquid vessels um, all over the Mediterranean. It seems like that selling or trading is absolutely something that's going on. As far as I know, there's no evidence um, yet. It doesn't mean it's not happening, but we've never, I don't think identified a Pelian pot in Italy or in the Levant, but we have of other pots from from like Mycenae, for example. So it's quite possible that there um, that this is also being produced for a wider market. It would make a, a very much sense. Also, I mean, I was just thinking in terms of there's different months. For example, the month of navigation is the month of navigation when we all go to Egypt and get supplies and, and trade. I don't know. Um, and one other thing, I can't remember the other thing I thought, so I'll stop talking there. You'll come back to it, <laughs> if, it, if, it come back, if it comes back to you. Okay, so uh, I'm going back to my gallery view here. Uh, please go ahead if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question. In, I'll I just, yeah, so ahead. go ahead. <laughs> I was just saying that I think everyone's probably done Friday at <laughs> 4 <laughs> 6. We're, we are approaching, um, we're approaching the time of the day and the week where you're starting to feel um, spent. I, if I may, if you'll allow me, I'd like to ask a final question uh, before we uh, we say thank you and, and, and goodbye. And that's just considering that your, your work is also doing the archaeology of archaeology, um, as you call it yourself. I mean, looking at stuff that's been excavated in 1939, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, um, what, what would you wish they'd done differently? Or will this take us into next week? <laughs> that would take us into next week, but I would say that the main thing I wish that they had done differently is that I wish that well, I really, you know, we can all wish that World War II never happened because they began the excavation, the discovery um, happened in 1939 and then World War II started and the operation had to be shut down. Anything that had been excavated was stored very, very quickly um, and maybe not the, the greatest amount of care was put into it to, to no fault of the archaeologists, of course, and then it wasn't resumed until 10 years later. And so that would be part of it. Um, Overall, I think that a, a better job could have just been done with storage. However, the actual documentation, from what I remember, is quite good. So the document, and that's really where you need to have, that's where the, it really lies, is to have your archaeologists take notes and describe, 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 and take pictures. And they did a very good job of doing that, I think. Um, so this is why people can still, especially most of the material from this excavation is owned by, owned under the purvey of University of Cincinnati. And that's why graduate students from University of Cincinnati to this day can produce really fascinating 
uh, studies on on the palace investor. Okay. Well, that it's just really interesting as sort of a as a lesson to future generations of archaeologists. It's it's interesting to consider what what to do and not what not to do. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Take well, lots of notes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Photograph yes. everything, question everything. <laughs> Twice, at least. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but this, is, uh, this has been a really, really delightful journey to, uh, to peel us. Uh, so thank you very, very much for that. And I'll just see if I can get us started on another Zoom applause. Um, and thank you so much for, uh, for doing this presentation for us. It was, uh, it was delightful. You're very um, welcome. Thank you to the audience. Oh, oh, we, well, we have, have more questions. one more question, just in the nick of time. Have they replicated any of the sense? From Arlene. Um, well, that's a good question. E a master's student, I came across a master's thesis not very long ago. Um, Megan, cannot, Megan M Mulas, I think is her name, and she did an experimental archaeology MA in which she attempted to recreate some of the scents and with varying degrees of success. I think she had a really hard time with the rose because it goes putrid very, very quickly in the oil. And um, yeah, it was an interesting study. Megan yeah. Mulas, I'm pretty sure. I found it on Academia. Megan Mulas, oh, yeah. good reference. Mm -hmm. And there is another one asking for a reference actually. It's Laura Massive who asked if you'd cite your publication for the henna oil experiment that you mentioned earlier. Yes, so that is actually one of the uh, publications that was in the recommended list um, that was, that's on the website. And so it's on my academia.edu profile and um, it's there. I don't have the photos from that experiment anymore because of a very tragic loss of my, I, I was robbed some years ago and I don't have any of that stuff, but I have the, the written documentation of the henna experiment which has not been picked up by the wider field of, of uh, perfume studies, but, or, or by, of, by Pelian perfume studies, but interestingly has been picked up by people who are just like generally into henna and perfume. So it shows up in these very strange kind of blog situations where like, well, Kyler has shown that henna cannot dye oil. And people are like, oh, well that just changes everything. But <laughs> I have yet to find a, a, a Pylos scholar who's, who's looking at the, the issue of dyeing oil in a different way. Kind of funny. I'd be someone... happy to work with you on it. Huh? I said I'd be happy to work with you on it. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I let's be I'll in... contact you. Yes, please contact me. I'd love that. Great. This is Laura. I, I don't know if you could see, but yeah, Laura. Yep. Yeah, I can see. Excellent. Well, this is great. And if you go to our website, the Ancient Attractions uh, website, uh, the reference for that article is there. Uh, under the description of Mary Jane's uh, lecture. And in one or two weeks time, the recording will also be available there. Um, so while I'm talking about that, uh, that website, I'm just going to do a little bit of advertising for our next lecture, uh, which is going to be the, um, uh, the <laughs> well, we're just getting reassuring news in the chat that the guy who stole, um, Mary Jane's computer did not steal oh, his. No, no. Uh, oh, no, I meant they. Oh, I thought you meant. Huh. No, they did steal my computer and all I, my backup hard drives. They did not steal. I, I thought you meant like stealing my concept, but I was confused. Apologies. Fair enough. <laughs> well, uh, it's good that we got that cleared out. Um, well, but just to say that in two weeks time, we're going to have our fifth and final lecture in the series. Uh, so that's on Friday, December 11th, and it's 3 p.m. Oslo time again. Uh, and the lecture in two weeks is going to be presented by Dr. Cecilia Bontz. She's a senior re researcher at the New Carlsberg Glyptotech in Copenhagen in Denmark. And the title of Cecilia's lecture is Colorful Beauties, What the Polychromy of Funerary Portraits Can Reveal About Dress and Appearance in Ancient Palmyra. So do join us for that uh, if you're uh, able to in, in two weeks time. Uh, so, I, and I will finally get the story about the beauty from Palmyra who's been sort of sitting behind me uh, for the past four uh, lectures. So all that remains now 
uh, for me to do is to thank all of you very, very much for uh, being with us this afternoon. Thank you for a very interesting discussion and for questions. Thank you especially to Mary Jane for uh, giving us her brilliant presentation um, and giving us a wonderful impression of a world very far away and very intriguing. So thank you so much to you, Mary Jane. Thank you so much for inviting me, Anna Katrina, and thank you all. I really appreciated the time that we got to spend together in Mycenaean Pilos.